Good morning. Good morning, everyone. And sorry for the delay. We've had a little bit of technical problems this morning. Um, but it's nice to see such a lively, active room and everybody talking and networking. And um, nice to see, see everybody here bright and early in the morning. Um, so I'm Krista Wilcox. I'm the Director General of the Office for Disability Issues with the Government of Canada. I have just flown in for today, so I apologize for not having uh, been able to be here for the rest of the week, but had some, some personal issues going on at home. So uh, but lovely to be here and lovely to see so many familiar faces and some new faces around the room. And I have the honor this morning to um, uh, moderate uh, an exciting panel of, um, of countries uh, to, who are going to present to us on what they're doing um, on, in, in their countries and, and to help us understand uh, how things are going on disability issues in Australia, the in New Zealand, and the UK. Uh, so we're going to start this morning um, with uh, my colleagues from New Zealand. I'd like to introduce Brian uh, Coffey, who is the Director of the Office for Disability Issues in New Zealand with the Government of New Zealand. Um, the Office of Disability Issues provides disability advocacy, and I'm sorry, I'm going to have to take my glasses off because I can't read with them on. <laughs> Uh, provides disability advocacy and advice across the government and has stewardship of the New Zealand disability strategy from 2016 to 2026. The disability action plan from 2019 to two 2022 <laughs> and governments reporting against the UN CRPD as well as secretary support for the New Zealand Sign Language Board. Prior to working at ODI, Brian has worked in a number of roles in the education sector as a teacher, educational psychologist, management and leadership positions within regional and district offices. Uh, he's been a busy, busy through his career. <laughs> And, and he has a long, a long, um, and dedicated passion to disability issues. <laughs> and um, with him presenting, um, he has, uh, I'm sorry, Lauren Jones from the Ministry of Health, uh, who also has a policy professional in, in both central and local governments and is leading policy analysis and advice to health ministers on approaches to improve health and well-being of people with disabilities. So I'm going to pass the floor over to Brian and Lauren. Uh, kia ora koutou. Um, this week is Te Wiki o te reo, te reo Māori in New Zealand, so you all need to say kia ora back. So kia ora koutou. Kia ora. Okay, so remember that when you come to Australia, uh, New Zealand. <laughs> <laughs> when you come to New Zealand in March 2021. <laughs> Via Australia. <laughs> Could you just get the right country? <laughs> <laughs> Kia ora koutou. Um, we're glad like to present to you today on how New Zealand is transforming its disability support system and um, looking at access and accountability um, for the disability community. Thank you. And it's really good to be here with um, Lauren, who's an emerging leader, and I'm, I'm a submerging leader. <laughs> <laughs> and we've had our first technical difficulty. Uh, excellent. Yeah. Okay. Good. Yeah. So as, as Lauren said, um, we're get, mainly going to focus on accountability within the context of the New Zealand Disability Strategy, the Action Plan, um, Enabling Good Lives and Mana Fai Kaha. So this isn't the complete story of New Zealand. Um, yesterday when I spoke to David Matthews, where is he? Didn't make it. Ah, oh, yeah. Yesterday when I spoke to David Matthews, who hasn't quite made it this morning, he's on his way good. So I said we were going to give the New Zealand update. And he said, well, you haven't asked me. And I said, yeah, I know. I didn't have to because I know what you think anyway. <laughs> so this is a government perspective. <laughs> um, so the first slide is just the strategic framework for um, the disability strategy and the action plan. So right up 
the top of, of course, is the UN Convention. Um, that's our mandate. And then the New Zealand Disability Strategy 2016 to 26 is trying to make that real in New Zealand over the next 10 years. And I'll talk a little bit about how that was developed. You have the strategy on your table, both an easy read as well as the full version. So I'm very happy for you to take that away with you. Um, we have developed an outcomes framework based on the eight outcomes on, in the strategy. Well, I've got to say it's under development because the real issue we have is um, lack of data. And while we've got 28 indicators against the eight outcomes, we've only got um, data for about 18 of those outcomes. But we're keeping those out, um, indicators there. Our advice to government has been it's much better to have the indicators that really matter to disabled people than just measure the things that are easy to measure. Um, and of course we've got the Disability Action Plan that's um, under development and next week or the week after that will go to Cabinet for um, ratification. I think the other really important thing about the slide is we've got the work of all agencies and government and the work of non-government organisations as well. Everyone contributes to the convention. It's not just a government um, thing to be done and um, there's plenty of good ideas outside of government we really need to recognise. So um, everyone, all New Zealanders actually can contribute to um, realising the convention and we all have um, different roles in doing that. So um, right at the centre of the development of the strategy and I've got to say in a long history back to um, the 2000s is um, the concept of nothing about us without us. And we've got up on the slide there a whakatauki, a, a um, saying from Māori, Nā ki te rauro, nā te rauro, ka ora ai te iwi. And it speaks to together um, holding the basket, we will be able to harvest the outcomes that we all want to achieve. So it actually speaks to cooperation, involvement, partnership, co-design, and that's at the basis of everything that we try to do. Um, we never get it right all of the time, we get it right most of the time, um, and it is very challenging, I've got to say, for government to do, to do this well. Um, and of course it's always been challenging for disabled people. Um, interesting in the development of the action plan because <clears throat> we'll talk later about the fact that um, once that's developed there'll be six monthly reporting and one agency said, hmm, bit of compliance here. <laughs> I kind of said like back, well, that's what you do to NGOs, government. <laughs> you keep asking for that reporting so isn't it time to actually um, do some reporting back? So um, a few photos there just to kind of highlight the kind of co-design that's hap happening. So in the top left hand we've got the Disability Strategy Advisory Group. This was a group that hung together for 18 months, two years, as there was two, um, two rounds of public consultation across New Zealand and as we looked at what came in from that consultation then designing the, the strategy that's in front of you. On the right, top right, um, there's actually a photo there um, and the M Minister Sepuloni, our Minister for Disability Issues, is um, actually in that photo and that was one of the Disability Action Plan consultation meetings um, at Pacifica Fono up in Auckland. Um, so again, it was really good to have the Minister's involvement in consultation as well as officials and um, DPOs working alongside us in the consultation process. And then the last photo there is actually once we had sifted through all the information from consultation and considered all the things that had happened, um, officials and the Disabled People's Organisation Coalition met um, in an afternoon as um, officials pitched the programmes of work that they think might actually advance the strategy and the eight outcomes. So fairly robust conversations took a little bit longer than we thought it would, but the engagement was important to give us confidence as officials that the things that we were doing were going to be the, be the right things. So as I said, the action plan comes out of the strategy, um, and um, this slide has the eight outcomes in the strategy. 
and then it kind of indicates where the action, action plan comes in. And of course, um, as we went around consulting, we said strategy is good. It says tells the direction we want to head, but actually, if you don't put it, put some things into action, you're just left with um, a sense of destination and no progress at all. So, on this slide, um, Jonathan, let me introduce Jonathan, um, Dr. Jonathan Godfrey, who's the um, president of Blind Citizens Association New Zealand. He's actually sitting in his office at Massey University where he's a statistics lecturer um, and he will talk about the involvement of the Disabled People's Organisation and their engagement with officials. So here in New Zealand we've been working on the new Disability Action Plan that's going to help government agencies change the way they offer services to all New Zealanders including the disabled people. And in my thinking about what is important for making sure that disabled people's needs are actually taken care of is to show government officials that there is a problem that they can help with. That means making sure that they collect data to inform the decisions they make. By collecting data that shows the experience of disabled people is not the same as the experience of the non-disabled population they serve. So considering how to decide whether a person is disabled or not becomes a key feature in any data collection exercise that a government undertakes. As a statistician, that isn't um, possibly going to some come as much of a surprise. The second key aspect that ensures that decisions being made by often non-disabled government officials is to make sure that the voice of disabled people is heard, is understood, is listened to. And that means engaging with disabled people or their representative organisations, often called disabled people's organisations. As the president of a DPO, I believe that we have the ability to take the combined views of our subpopulation, in my case blind people, discuss an issue, talk about it, work out our differences and come to an agreed collective position means that the feedback that my organisation can offer government officials is actually going to be quite well considered. It's not just a thought at the moment a question is asked. Quality information, quality feedback requires quality engagement by government officials. I reckon that if a government official asks disabled people for their opinions, values the information they receive, and understands that they're doing so because the experience of disabled people is different to the experiences of non-disabled people, that in the end they'll do their job better because they will be serving everybody in our country. Thank you. And the next slide um, identifies some of the accountability and oversight mechanisms that we're going to put in place. So again, um, drawing on what Jonathan has said, if you're going to go out and consult, then there's actually um, a responsibility to do something about it, to follow through on that consultation. And then in doing that, then report back on how things are going. So in this slide I've identified some of the accountability mechanisms that we have in place, but um, again I'm going to hand over to Paula Tesserio, who's the um, Human Rights Commissioner, to give her view on um, accountability and the mechanisms that are in place. In New Zealand we have an independent monitoring mechanism which comprises of three organisations, the Chief Ombudsman, the Disability Rights Commissioner, which is my role, and our seven 
disabled people's organisations who arrange themselves as a coalition to form part of the IMM. And collectively, we are mandated by Cabinet to monitor New Zealand's compliance with the CRPD. We have a number of ways in which we do that. We provide reports to the UN CRPD committee every five years as part of our examination. We also work with government agencies to hold agencies to account and provide information to them and receive information about the progression of rights under the CRPD. One of the things we also do is meet with a ministerial leadership group which is chaired and convened by our Minister for Disability Issues. She leads a group of ministers who meet with the IMM on a quarterly basis and the key things that we discuss are the top issues that disabled New Zealanders would like to see advanced. So we receive reports from the ministerial leadership group ahead of meetings and then we attend meetings and we talk about the progress that has been made. Where progress has not been made, we're able to provide some challenge to that. But we also acknowledge that there is often work that is done um, that positively advances our rights. So we find this a really useful way of getting up-to-date information from ministers and being able to monitor and hold government to account. Okay, so again, the slides that I've presented are just around the disability strategy and the action plan. Um, I'm now going to hand over to Lauren who will talk about enabling good lives and mana whaikaha. And so just seeing that you're seeing the levels, um, enabling good lives was one of the actions that came out of the last action plan and will continue on into the current action plan under systems transformation or mana whaikaha so that there's oversight, so that there's oversight of um, these important programs as they move forward. Kia ora koutou. I'd like to share with you how New Zealand is transforming its disability support system in partnership with the disability community. I'm going to cover a little bit of background about Enabling Good Lives and Mana Kaha, our current prototype, as well as introducing you to Jerry Pombury. Now, Jerry is our national president of the Disabled Persons Assembly and she is involved in Enabling Good Lives regionally and locally, including co-chairing with a family member, uh, the Enabling Good Lives Governance Group. She's joining us via video clip, and I'd like to apologize in advance for the lack of subtitles, which unfortunately we didn't get sorted in time for today, but thank you. Um, so, the purpose of the disability support system, transformation, is to ensure that disabled people have greater choice and control and decision-making authority over their own lives and supports and greater connection to the communities. In 2011, a working group from the disability community published a report called Enabling Good Lives. This set out an approach um, that's focused on um, some key principles which include self-determination and beginning early Mana enhancing. Now, mana is a really central concept into our Māori, the Māori world, which I'm going to try and explain, which is everybody is sort of born and inherent of dignity and honour that comes through ancestry, but it's also strengthened by how you treat others and your relationships. And it's also about having ordinary life outcomes and um, mainstream services first. So in 2012, the New Zealand government endorsed a new direction for the disability support system based on the Enabling Good Lives approach. And since 2013, New Zealand's been testing in a couple of areas and demonstrations how this could work in practice. Now this includes in Christchurch, focused on disabled scored leavers, and in a region called the Waikato with a wider focus. 
This has led us to where we are now with the co-design of a new prototype of the disability support system, Manafai Kaha. The central concept of this brand is that disabled people should have um, the steer of their own walker, a canoe, so symbolic of their own lives and direction. Some of the key features of the system is their multiple entry points, um, the welcomed into the system, whether that's to find out information and support, or what services and supports they may be able to access. Um, people can choose to, have, uh, to work with a connector, which is somebody that will walk alongside the disabled person and talk to them about what it is they want out of life, what are their aspirations, and talk to them about, with their families, what are the options out there in the community or through supports that will help you achieve what it is that you want to do. As part of this is connected support across government. Um, it includes support funding from the welfare system. And there's also um, a more flexible funding model, including personal budgets, where somebody will, their story will be passed on from the disabled person and connector to a funding team. And the person will be supported to look at, well, from this pot of money, where do I want to spend it to achieve what it is that I want to do? Another co part relating to accountability is that there's co governance of this system. So I'm just going to quickly show you um, a couple of clips of stories of people who have actually been experiencing the Enabling Good Lives approach and what this means to them. Oops. Just while Lauren's mm -hmm. doing that, I just add that. Um, just this week at the Public Service Awards, at the Public Service Awards in New Zealand, um, Enabling Good Lives um, actually won one of the awards in terms of um, the spirit of service. Yes, and that was also for leadership and governance um, in partnership. Mm -hmm. But since Enabling Good Lives has come along, just the flexibility on. That's not playing, so we might have to come back to that one. Sorry about that. Um, I will send around the YouTube clip later if that doesn't work, but um, there's a four-minute video, and there's many pe uh, stories where people are talking about their own experience and how it's changed their lives. So to move on to co-design, how did we get to where we are now? So in 2017, the new process began, and the then Minister for Disability Issues and the Health Minister set out as some key principles for what they would like the new disability support system to look like. These were high level, they must be based on the Enabling Good Lives approach, and um, it must learn from the existing demonstrations of this approach. It had to work within a capped amount of funding, connect up different government services, and also um, the social investment approach, so uh, intervening early. So I'm going to pass it over to Jerry to explain her experience of the co-design process, but it was essentially a high-level design with a smaller working group of disabled people and families that worked intensively over a couple of months um, to look at sort of what did they want their experience to be, how do they bring in the voice of people, particularly the voice of people who don't have voices, and from a high-level design, moved into detailed design with 20 working groups and virtual groups, with at least one-third being disabled people and no more than one-third being government officials, including a public online forum with different accessibility methods where anybody could look at what's happening and provide their views. My design was a really interesting process for disabled people. It involved a high level of trust of the process with the process and um, was a little bit rocky to begin with so there were five disabled people in the group two family members two service providers and three officials and the process was enabled by a design company we came as disabled people we definitely came from an enabling good lives perspective we really wanted to see critical elements in, implemented in the prototype that enabled self-determination mana was relationship building for disabled people and gave them the control and choice they wanted in their lives 
it was difficult for officials to trust that we brought a genuine expertise of lived experience and it was difficult for disabled people to trust that officials had genuine intent to collaboratively share the process. It would be fair to say that we were really surprised by the richness and depth of thought and depth of conversation during the process. And at the end of the process, officials commented that they couldn't have designed something as diverse and broad-reaching without disabled people's input. And very quickly, because I'm aware I have about one minute left, um, <laughs> There is a whole series of co-governance groups and leadership groups across Enabling Good Lives, and they provide independent advice to ministers on how things are working and what should change. And I'll just let Jerry have the final word. The other thing we've done is we've implemented a core group function, which involves having monthly core group meetings where we can have robust debate among disabled people in the community. From these core groups, we have leadership group representatives who can bring the community's thinking to the table and shape it. In Mid Central, we also have a governance group player who make actual decisions and give advice to the minister. We have a group also called National Enabling Good Lives, who are the kaitiaki or stewards of the enabling good lives approach and principles. This type of format really encourages people to work to their strengths and abilities and has really incubated leadership skills in our people. In our group in the Waikato, Glenn facilitates our core group meetings introduces guests to our forums and contributes to the thinking and strategic approach we bring to the leadership table. He speaks up, he interacts with our local mayor and councillors and asks really strategic questions at open meetings. We feel really proud and it makes our hearts sing to see people from our community stepping up and into leadership roles. Thank you. And Glenn, who was mentioned there, has a learning disability and is sort of essential to governance processes. Right. If you'd like to find out any further information, we will be at the Marketplace stall this afternoon. Um, we will also play the video that would not play here. So please come along and say kia ora and thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a really interesting presentation. I know in Canada we've benefited from having Jerry in person at our when we had the senior leaders group um, meeting two years ago in Ottawa. Um, Jerry came in and spoke to senior leaders in uh, the government of Canada, and everybody was really impressed with the process and found it really interesting. So, thank you very much for that presentation. I'm buying some time because the technical problems are. <laughs> I want to make sure we're all set up here. Aisling, are you going to click through for Mary? Okay. Um, so I'm delighted now to turn to um, our colleague from Australia, Marianne Diamond. Again, sorry, I have to move my glasses so I can see. Uh, Marianne is the general manager of stakeholder engagement at the National Disability Insurance Agency in Australia. She has previously held roles as the chair of the International Disability Alliance and past president of the World Blind Union. And she's had a range of roles in, the, in Australia as well as at the global level and, and is a real leader on disability issues. And I'm pleased to pass the floor over to her. Here, my, I will bring the mic over to you, Mary. Um, I think I'm mic'd up. Oh, you're mic'd up. Yes, yeah. Thank yeah. You. Thanks, Krista. Is the mic on? Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes? Okay, thank you. No? Yes, now you can. Thank you. I feel like the rose sitting here with multiple people from UK and New Zealand on either side. Um, I just remind the people from UK we did win the Ashes. Just. <laughs> So it's, it's a pleasure to be here and to talk to you about the situation for people with disabilities in Australia. Some of you I know have heard a lot about our progress in recent years, but I'm aware that some of you don't know so much. So 
For those who know a lot, I'm sorry if I cover ground you're already aware of. So a few facts about Australia before I talk about our greatest social reform since the introduction of universal health care. So Ashling's managing the slide, so I'll say go to the next slide, please. So in 1993, Australia introduced the Disability Discrimination Act, a federal law um, preventing discrimination. Not a law with a lot of meat. I think the ADA here in this country might be stronger. In 2008, we ratified the UNCRPD and we reported to the committee in 2013 and are there in Geneva now reporting again for the second time. In 2015, Australia ratified the Marrakesh Treaty. And if you don't know what the Marrakesh Treaty is, I'm the person to talk to because I led the civil society work for five years in the negotiations with the World Property Organisation. So I, it was my life. Slept, ate and dreamt about it. <laughs> Traditionally, services for people with disabilities in Australia had been provided by our state and territory governments. It was recognised and a report prepared by the disability community called Shutout recognised that the services were crisis driven, underfunded, unfair and inadequate. And around 10 years ago, people with disabilities, providers of services, families and carers and the general community mobilised and lobbied government for change. And in 2013, the National Disability Insurance Scheme Act was passed in Parliament, our Federal Parliament, by both, with support from both sides of government, which is a very unusual position to find yourself in. The overarching framework for a more inclusive society enabling people with disabilities to participate is the National Disability Strategy. It has been signed up by all governments and it is currently being reviewed and refined. The NDIS sits within this framework and you'd be forgiven to think it was the other way round because all the attention has been given in recent years to the NDIS. It's the one that has money, the strategy has no money. In June 2019, the Australian Government appointed the first Minister for the NDIS and this is a Minister in Cabinet so that's um, a huge step forward for us. In April 2019, our Governor-General announced a three-year Royal Commission into the violence, abuse, neglect and exploitation of people with disabilities. And just last month in August, the Government announced a partial review of the NDIS Act, focusing on simplification and removing red tape. And at the same time, Government is um, developing a participant service agreement, which will come into place July next year. So if we move to our next slide, the NDIA, NDIA is the agency established by government to implement the NDIS, so the agency and the other one is the, strategy, is the scheme. And I can assure you we have less governmental agencies than Sweden does. <laughs> We have a very complex governance structure um, in the NDIS. We have many bosses. We have a minister. We have a board. Every state and territory minister for disabilities is, is also our bosses. And as much as our states and territories wanted to get out of the disability services space, they won't let go in the decision making part. So our mission is to build a world leading national disability insurance scheme. And our purpose is to increase the ability of individuals with a significant and permanent disability, we refer to as our participants, to be more independent and to engage more socially and economically. And deliver a financially sustainable NDIS that builds genuinely connected, engaged community and stakeholders. We have a corporate plan that we work to with aspirations and goals and our current plan has five aspirations. A quality experience and outcomes for our participants, a competitive market with innovative supports, a connected and engaged stakeholder sector, financially sustainable scheme and a high performing NDIA. And the NDIA is underpinned by four values. We value people, we grow together, we aim higher and we take care. If we move to our next slide, before talking about our achievements today, some key points I'd like to make. Government doubled the money for disability services with the introduction of the NDIS. All Australian citizens are shareholders in the NDIS, paying a levy in our tax. 
State disability money, so money spent by states and territories governments in disability services were all redirected into the NDIS. There is an eligibility criteria to join the NDIS. There is no means testing to be a participant. Um, and for people who wish to relocate just or move house, just like anyone else might do, you take your supports with you. You no longer go to the bottom of the list in that location to get services. Partici as a participant, we are able to set our goals, determine what supports we need to achieve those goals. And we can get services and support from who we choose when we choose. The scheme is based on a social insurance model, invest early in people. The scheme is delivered by the NDIA, as I mentioned, in partnership with a number of partner organisations located in the community. And they make up about 70% of our total workforce. And we have some with us here today. Now, as at the 30th of June 2019, the scheme had been in place three years trial and then three years um, introduction across the country. Around 300,000 Australians are benefiting from the NDIS. And this includes more than 5,300 children aged zero to six who come through our early childhood, early intervention gateway. 100,000 people receiving services and supports for the very first time. More than 25,000 of our participants have a psychosocial disability and more than 21,000 registered providers of support at this stage. So if we make, move to our next slide where we talk about growth. So there's two key concurrent challenges for us. One is a significant growth in demand for supply significant shift in how services are delivered. A shift from block funding where governments would give organisations and often large traditional service providers money to develop services and to provide to their clients. So we've shifted to participant choice and control where we manage our services and our own budgets. The chart shows the supply of growth needed at full scheme and that is when we expect around 500,000 participants to have an individual package. Our scheme actuary is working with our state and territory um, colleagues to analyse the supply um, gaps and these may be gaps in services provided in particular locations, they might be particular types of services. So if we move to our next slide Getting people with disabilities onto the scheme quickly has been a priority for government and that brought with it some challenges. Here's a snapshot of some of the priorities for the NDIA for 2019 as we work to improve the experience for participants and achieve a consistency of our services across the country. We expect to spend $10 billion this year in support um, in, a, in participants' plans. We have rolled out a new website. As at the start of July, we have um, moved into all states and territories, just a couple of places in Western Australia to come, and they'll be in by July next year. We've strengthened our in information linkages and capacity building program to have a more purposeful plan for grants to assist organisations and communities become accessible and capacity building for organisations and individuals, especially focusing on user-led organisations of people with disability and families. We are participating in a cross-government working group on employment and we are rolling out a number of key pathways for people, participants, who might have situations which are very complex, mental health issues, people from cold communities, and people, Indigenous people, etc. Ensuring they are supported by skilled people as they join the NDIS and implement their plans. Changes to provision of assistive technology and home modifications, assisting our participants to get what they need quickly. Reforms to supported disability accommodation with a focus on getting people into the places they want to live and who they want to live with. Getting young people with disabilities who currently live in aged care facilities into their preferred accommodations. If we move to the next slide, 
Um, I'd just like to share before I finish some key observations after three years of trial and three years of um, rollout across the country. Um, in the first year, participants generally get, use the same services and the same providers that they have done in the past, not unexpectedly. By the third year they're in the scheme, they have sometimes moved to new providers and moved to new services, building confidence to do so. The first year someone's in the scheme, their utilisation of their budget is only around 47%, but by the third year it's closer to 80%. And there's lots of reasons for that. It might be they don't know what to do, they, there's no services in the area they live, so there's a whole range of uh, reasons. There's a huge amount of work to be done to build the market of innovative services. Often, smaller organisations who are providers of services have made the shift in their business model to account for the NDIS rather than our old, big, traditional, wealthy organisation. Still remains a lot to build on um, our workforce and our partners' workforce to ensure that there is consistency and it doesn't matter where you live in the country that you will get the same supports. People with disabilities have a huge role in setting our goals, determining our um, support and managing our money. And if you've never made a decision for yourself in your life, lived in an institution where someone decided everything for you, this will take time. It's very exciting, but still much to do as we, um, as we introduce this um, really amazing scheme and it's great to be part of it. We will be at the marketplace at lunchtime and we will be showing some small clips of participants of our scheme telling their own stories. But there's lots of people here in the room from our partners from NDIA who would be more than willing to talk to anyone about the detail of our scheme if you're interested. So thanks for your time and just while I've got the mic, I encourage everyone when you come to such exchanges, please support not just emerging leaders but people with disability. Thank you. Thank you very much for that great presentation, Marianne, and um, interesting to see where, where Australia has come on this, because we've heard, as you're on your journey, we've heard a lot about you know, where your progress is made, so it's it's great to hear where, where you're going and, and uh, where you're at now. So now I'm delighted to turn the floor over to our colleagues from England. Um, we have three presenters from, from there. So David Nettle is the Deputy Director for Dementia and Disabilities at the Department of Health and Social Care. And I'm just going to give you a little summary. He, he's working on an autism strategy. He's responsible for persons with learning disabilities. And he is also working around the National Workforce Policy and Corporate Strategy. Is that fair to summarize? Good. <laughs> uh, Clinton. F Far F I'm not going to get it right, Farkasson, Farkasson thank you, um, is the chair of Think Local Act Personal Partnership Board. He's also a member, sh member of the NHS Assembly and set up to oversee the NHS 10-year plan and is the current chair of Quality Matters, a trustee of the Race Equality Foundation, ambassador for Disability Rights UK. And I'm summarizing here so that we give you more time to speak. And Carolyn Spears uh, has spent over 20 years working for local government, adult social care departments in roles that covered policy and commissioning. She was a personalization lead before joining the Think Local Act Personal Partnership in 2014 as a policy advisor and becoming its head in 2017. Over to you. Great, thanks very much. Um, thank you for that. So, um, uh, I have responsibility for um, policy within England on, uh, uh, as just described, um, autism, dementia, learning disability, physical disability, and um, children with special educational needs and disability, or at least the health inputs um, for support for those children. Uh, I'm really pleased to be really pleased to be here uh, at the exchange um, today which is the first time uh, England has, has um, attended one of these events uh, and um, really looking forward and have been uh, making uh, 
uh, use of the opportunity to make connections and links with all the work that's going on um, in other countries. And, and I think one of the things that uh, I really took from the discussion yesterday was the degree of commonality of some of the problems and policy issues that are being faced in different countries. And um, particularly thinking about the presentation from colleagues in Scotland yesterday and from America around some of the uh, similar issues um, that we are thinking through in, in England about deinstitutionalization and development of, of really good community alternatives for supporting people with learning disabilities and autistic people in our, in our communities. Um, just You could almost swap some of the words and we would be sort of talking about our experience um, in England. Um, also really pleased to be here with my colleagues from um, Think Local, Act Personal, Caroline and Clinton, who'll be talking a little bit later. One of the things that we're really keen to do is to make sure that this isn't kind of uh, me on behalf of the government kind of coming to an exchange like this, but really making use of the um, membership and, connect and, and the ability to connect up, uh, particularly with people who have a little bit more experience of delivering services on the ground, um, and I, I suppose more experience of the action part of the three A's, uh, whereas I can probably talk a little bit more about accountability uh, and some of the more system level issues. Um, in the presentation here, I'm just going to try and set the scene a little bit around disability policy um, in England. And I wanted to start with the Equality Act of 2010, which is, is perhaps the most important piece of legislation um, in respect of disability in England. Um, it is the legislation that prohibits um, discrimination and it requires um, uh, all public services to have regard for the needs of people with a disability and um, also to ensure uh, good relations between different groups with different protected characteristics, which includes disability. Um, and perhaps the most important, or one of the most uh, important elements of that legislation is uh, that it requires all public services to make reasonable adjustments to ensure that those services are accessible to um, disabled people and other people with protected characteristics. Um, I put the, the definition up here on the slide as well of, of disability in England because um, the way we define it is um, any impairment which is long-term and has an impact on a person's ability to undertake what you might call a routine or daily um, activity. And that means that in terms of um, when we are talking about um, disabled people, we are talking about children, young people, um, those of um, working age, so under 65, um, uh, but we're also talking about older people who might develop frailty or you know, collect a range of health conditions over time. And it's kind of an important point for us because um, uh, older people's services might tend to be um, considered to be a social care discussion, and, and that's the kind of context in which we'd be talking about policy there. Uh, whereas we talk about disability policy issues, we're, we're typically talking about those of, who are under 65. Um, a sort of random pick of some facts and figures, I suppose, but we have um, in England around 14 million people um, who uh, report having a disability themselves, uh, and that's a, a, an increasing number even compared to only a few years ago. Uh, in terms of our public expenditure on social care support, um, the debate tends to be dominated around about um, by discussion about services for older people because there are many more of them receiving um, social care support but actually in terms of the funding the majority of public expenditure goes on support for those um, younger adults uh, with a disability. Uh, we have significant um, health inequality so for autistic people um, life expectancy is estimated to be 16 years less than the general population uh, and there's a, a comparable um, figure for those people with a, a learning disability, sadly. Um, we have about 1.2 million uh, wheelchair users in the UK. Um, about 700,000 people are estimated to be autistic uh, uh, in the UK and about 1.2 million people with learning disabilities in England. Um, so again, just to kind of set the scene, um, uh, 
this is kind of giving a sense of the importance of some of the services that we are trying to um, develop. Um, this slide is, is just giving a bit of a sense of um, the kind of legal framework that supports um, disabled people. Um, the Children and Families Act uh, is the piece of legislation that sets out um, how we support children with a special educational need or a disability and um, describes our system of education, health uh, and care uh, plans and the sorts of ways in which commissioners should work together to provide support to those children and, uh, and young people. Uh, we have um, requirements in terms of accessibility of information that's provided by the National Health Service and uh, local government to people and all organisations are required to ensure that their communications are fully accessible and that can mean um, providing it in different formats, um, it can be uh, make sure, making sure that we have information um, that is provided um, to people who have visual impairments or hearing impairments as well. Um, perhaps, uh, or another very important piece of legislation in, in terms of support for disabled people is the CARE Act. Um, now the CARE Act defines um, and sets out the criteria by which support is offered to people who have um, an ongoing social care support need. And it's centered around something called the well-being principle. Um, in short, uh, the CARE Act requires that anybody that has uh, an eligible social care need should receive such support. Um, there is a um, means test, which means that depending on your financial circumstances, some individuals might need to make a contribution, but everybody should have access to um, the care and support that they need. Um, at the end, I just mentioned the UN Convention on the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. Um, again, a very similar thread um, to all of the other country presentations that we've heard today and yesterday. Um, I'm not going to say a huge amount about the UNCRPD, other than to note that um, uh, the extent to which um, we have implemented that in England is a matter of um, some contention. Uh, and there is a, um, uh, I think fair to say, disagreement between government and um, the sector in England about the extent to which some of those rights have actually been brought into being. And I highlight Article 19 at the bottom there because I think that is really the uh, element of the UNCRPD which is um, subject to the most uh, serious debate. Um, and I've also highlighted the well-being principle there because from a government perspective, uh, it's the well-being principle that is intended to bring to life Article 19, um, but there is some debate about the extent to which that has been actually implemented uh, in practice. Um, we have actually, uh, I can't actually work out at the moment whether it was uh, late yesterday or early this morning, but we have just published our annual report on the UNCRPD implementation from a government perspective, so that is available for people to have a look at. The other bits of legislation which I think are quite important to point out um, uh, and are also contentious are the Mental Health Act, the Mental Capacity Act and the Mental Capacity Amendment Act, which is a recent piece of legislation. Um, the, the kind of linking thread between those three um, acts is that they are all about um, the situations in which you can have a lawful restriction of people's rights uh, in order to support them with um, treatment for mental health um, conditions and, and I guess any piece of legislation in that sort of space is always going to be um, contentious both in terms of what's in scope of the legislation and, and in practice how that is um, enacted. Um, this is uh, actually intended to be a kind of simplified uh, description uh, of uh, both funding flows and accountability. I think Caroline's got a much better uh, simplified um, uh, diagram, but essentially I think there's a kind of a couple of points that I wanted to make with this um, slide. The first is that um, uh, there are lots of different routes of accountability. Um, 
On the left hand side, uh, what this is showing is that um, government sets uh, what we call the mandate, so the description of things that the National Health Service is required um, to deliver to people uh, and provides uh, a funding envelope to support that. Um, and within the National Health Service, which is um, publicly funded and free at the point of use, uh, where access is based on clinical need, um, funding flows through different commissioning bodies uh, who will take local decisions about what services are provided, um, and then that is ultimately um, provided to disabled people and people generally. On the right-hand side of the diagram, um, we have provision that goes through directly through local government outside of the NHS. And, and as the diagram attempts to show, you, this goes through different government departments, it goes through different um, uh, lo local government departments before reaching disabled people. So you've got kind of a, a very mixed um, uh, provider landscape. You have different commissioners acting and so actually the experience of an individual on the ground will be determined by um, the decisions made by local commissioners. Uh, so you have that kind of extent of accountability whilst um, national central government is setting the overall policy and legal context and defining the sorts of rights and expectations that people can have for their services. Um, the second point I was going to make with this, with this slide is that actually um, uh, effectively health bits will come through the National Health Service and that's a relatively straightforward um, uh, system to describe. Um, social care provision uh, under the Care Act does, uh, eligibility is, is assessed uh, according to an individual's needs, but actually com in contrast to the NHS, um, you, have to, you may have to pay for some components of that depending on the um, income and assets that you hold, and that can um, lead to some interesting debates about eligibility and entitlement and, um, and some differences geographically. So anyway, this isn't intended to be a deep dive into our legislation and uh, <laughs> system, so I'm just, but I think it's quite important to kind of understand some of those contexts which um, Clinton and Caroline will sort of bring to life a little bit when we talk about um, services. Um, Bit, bit of a pen picture in terms of um, some of the services that the uh, and some of the policies that the Department of Health and Social Care, um, so my department, are, are involved in. Um, and uh, I think an important point to make here is that the Department of Health and Social Care um, is not responsible for disability policy per se. We are responsible for um, health and social care components of that. Um, within England currently, uh, disability is, I hesitate to use the word, but I can't think of a better one, mainstreamed um, such that each individual government department will have responsibility for um, ensuring proper access to services for disabled people. So the Department for Transport has an inclusive um, transport strategy. We uh, have the lead on autism generally. Uh, DWP, the Department of Wealth, uh, Department of Work and Pensions, uh, has responsibility for the welfare system. So, um, uh, the services that we provide, you could argue, are, are not as, um, or our strategy around supporting disabled people is not as um, coherent as perhaps it, perhaps it could be. Um, so to give a little, a little sense of some of the, the, the policies that we offer um, and provide, uh, we fund um, limb centres to provide uh, sports prostheses for children. Um, that's something which currently uh, is above and beyond what the National Health Service would offer. They offer prostheses, but we will offer, um, we have a, a dedicated fund for things like running blades and other activity um, prostheses. Uh, we have a um, specific grant which is paid to the Lidomiders um, in respect of their uh, additional health costs. So we have a fund which pays um, direct benefits to um, the Lidomiders uh, to use as they wish on the sort of support uh, that they um, require. Um, and we currently uh, have a £2 million capital fund available uh, 
to NHS hospitals if they want to invest in the provision of so-called changing places toilets, which are a much larger than standard accessible um, toilet facility with hoists uh, uh, for people with um, profound and multiple learning disabilities and physical disabilities. Um, I think recognising that um, our approach to disability could, could be much better um, joined up across government departments. Uh, earlier this year, the then Prime Minister launched a new drive um, to address the, the, the barriers that are faced by disabled people in, in, in our country. Uh, and uh, there was an initial announcement setting out greater focus on um, improving accessibility standards for new housing to ensure that any new housing that's built meets some uh, uh, minimum requirements, uh, improvements to the way that statutory sick pay works for disabled people, and improving the support which is offered um, in the workplace. Um, but cri critically, uh, and, and, and probably um, as important as some of those particular uh, things that were announced, was the formation of a new cross-government disability team, which will um, incorporate our existing Office of Disability Issues, um, but expands it significantly. So work joining up all of the individual um, efforts of, of the, and policies across different government departments to provide a much more coherent um, offer to people. Um, and then, and then, sort of finally, just to say before I hand over to Carolina Clinton, I think what we um, see as the advantages of um, participating in in the IIDL um, uh, is an opportunity really to um, understand some of that innovation and best practice which is happening in all the different countries that are represented here today. Um, we'd really like to take the opportunity to share some of our best practice as well. We think we have some um, things that do work well and um, we want to kind of test that and share it um, and uh, as mentioned at the start you know equally important to me is that it's not just me and my organization that are making those connections but that um, our sort of grassroots organizations and service delivery organizations are able to connect up with their counterparts in different countries too um, so at that point I'll hand over to um, Caroline and Clinton to talk a little bit about their work with Think Local, Act Personal. I'm Clinton Ferguson, Chair of Think Local, Act Personal, and a member of the National Co-Production Advisory Group. And I'm here with Caroline Spears, who's the head of TLAP. And David has talked about the policy context that informs health and social care in England. Caroline and I will now spend a few minutes describing what TLAP does to support the policy and how we deliver on the title of today's theme, leading the way forward on access, accountability and action. Caroline is going to start us off. Over to you, Caroline. Thank you, Clinton. Hi, everyone. Um, I just want to say it's an absolute privilege to be here. I'm having the best time, um, and I think you're all incredible, and I'm learning so much, and I hope that you'll learn a bit um, about our work and what we're doing and maybe take some of that back to your locality. So um, Think Local App Person, or TLAP for short, because we haven't got time to keep saying it in full, that's for sure, um, is a partnership, and it's a partnership of more than 50 national organisations. It includes central government, local government, national health service, national provider organisations, but crucially, it also includes people with lived experience and carers, and that really is our unique, our USP. That's what kind of makes us unique. Um, and... In a sense, we bring all of the key stakeholders together. <coughs> this is my simple diagram. <laughs> we bring all the key stakeholders together as equal partners to discuss the development and implementation of health and social care, particularly health and, and social care. So our partnership was established in the wake of um, some policy that you may have heard of called Putting People First. Um, and Putting People First was um, driven by disabled people as part of a campaign to ensure they had much greater choice and control over their care and support. Um, the intention and the ambition of TLAP 
was and remains to support organisations to transform what they do through personalisation. Because that's our bottom line, really. People really don't want a service. What they want is a life, and that's what we set out to support organisations to, to deliver in partnership with people. Um, so how do we support a life and not a service? What exactly is it we do? Well, um, apologies, it's a very busy slide, but we do a number of things. First of all, we produce a number of resources. Um, some of them are here, and we've got some, and they'll be in the marketplace, so come, come and talk to us. Um, we don't produce training guides. That's not at all what we do. What we set out to do is shift power and try to change culture um, because that's what we need to do. It's not about telling people. It's not about process and mechanism. We've got to go much deeper than that. We know that. Um, so we focus on what matters to people, not what is the matter, and we focus on what's strong as well as what's wrong. <coughs> We run regular networks throughout the year, so we focus on three key areas. We focus on self-directed support, building community capacity and care markets and quality. And across those three areas, we, we, we will always um, look at, bring in um, disruptive innovators. We showcase innovation at all of our events because there is some fantastic stuff going on in England. Um, the problem is it's a bit marginal and we want to make it um, centre. We want to make it mainstream. Um, we will look at the evidence and research and what that means for us. And we don't only look at the evidence and research that's coming down the line, we actually contribute to evidence and research. And similarly with policy, we look at what's coming down from national bodies, national government, but actually we contribute to, to policy and influence and inform policy upwards as well. Um, is, this, is this still working? Um, we also run podcasts and webinars so we can you know, reach out and have a... Um, have a much wider, broader national network. And every bit, every bit of our activity is legitimised by, by working with people with lived experience. Um, people with lived experience are involved in absolutely everything we do. So, in a sense, our focus is on making the rhetoric of great policy and legislation that David's already set out real in terms of how people experience care and support. And one of the resources we've developed is something called Making It Real. And some people call this a framework. Actually, I think it's a number of things. It's a framework, it's a philosophy, it's a set of principles, and some people will call it a toolkit. So actually, it's four for one, so you know, great value, to be fair. Um, and it sets out what good personalised care looks like from the citizen's perspective. It was led by, developed by people with lived experience, and over 80 national organizations provided input into its development too. So certainly one of the most co-produced documents I've ever been involved with. And as you can see, it, it examines um, six areas of people's lives that we think are the most important in terms of how we deliver um, personalized care and support. We've, on your table, you've got a little card that summarises making it real. I've got copies of the real version, um, and, and they'll be available in, in the marketplace. Um, what I want to say is that making it real recognises, as I said earlier, that it's not enough to change processes or mechanisms or procedures. We have to go much, much deeper than that. We have to radically shift a power um, dynamic. Um, Making it real is, looks very sweet and innocent, and it sort of is, except if done properly, it is very, very subversive. Gently subversive, quietly subversive, but it is sub subversive. So on that note, I'm going to hand you over to Clinton, who's going to say much more about what we do and how we do it. And Caroline has already talked about uh, TLAP's key focus of involving people with lived experience in all that we do. We do this through a collaboration with organisation called the National Co-Production Advisory Group, uh, NCAG for short, of which I'm a member, uh, as well as being the chair of uh, TLAP. As you can see from the slide, NCAG is a, a rich, a diverse group of citizens who work with TLAP to contribute their expertise and experience of both policy development and practical activity. NCAG members share their stories so we can all learn. Not only do these stories make clear the reality of people's lives and how they can uh, conflict with the rhetoric of policy,
but it's uh, but it is um, now becoming more acceptable that these stories make an essential contribution to the evidence base for personalization. And when we talk about um, personalization, what we mean is a paradigm shift away from what we call a professional gift model to a citizenship model. And the author of this model was uh, Simon Duffy from the Centre of uh, Welfare Reform. And you can see from the professional uh, gift model that people are right at the bottom of the chain of power. And in this uh, model, taxes go to the government. The government transfers funding to professional bodies like the social service department and providers of care. The person is assessed by the professional to establish what kind of professional care is needed. And the care is then provided by other professionals. So as you can see, this model is dom dominated by professionals, four professionals, with the citizen right at the bottom of the chain. Where uh, in the citizenship model, the person has real power and leads their life as part of a community of family, friends, and fellow citizens. Instead, we can imagine, uh, uh, instead we can imagine a system where disabled people actually have real power and responsibility where their relationship between the disabled person, the professional uh, groups and government are much more balanced. Services are available and agreed on the basis of equal relationship between the citizen and the professional. So in this model, the citizen model, people have real power and, be, uh, and, and be, uh, have control of resources and are accepted as equal partners. Uh, shortly after personalisation became part of policy framework for delivering care and support in England, the world experienced a financial meltdown, which has been devastated impact on the health and care sector in England. There has been a seven billion reduction in adult social uh, care alone since 2010. As a result, it has been harder and harder to get the most basic of support. So in terms of next step for social care in England, a long-term sustainable funding is an absolutely critical. But however, we are uh, very clear that money in itself is not enough. We have to continue to be radically changing the way support is provided. While there are some incredible examples of human-centred approaches that value the expertise of citizens and bringing, the, bringing and recognising the role of community, these examples are very marginal. We are working with a number of local government organisations and providers and citizens to support the growth and support of innovation across the sector in England. And to support this development, TLAP has just recently uh, launched what we are informally calling the Rainbow of Innovations. The Rainbow provides a visual representation of what we think human size and human shaped approaches should look like across different stages of our lives. We are hoping that funders will be motivated to invest in these sorts of examples that citizens themselves will shout for this kind of approach. We can show you what resources look like in more detail if you visit us on our stand in the innovation marketplace. We also have a lot of other publications we can share with you to give you more information on what we discussed today. That's um, all that we have time for now, but our ask of you all is to take, making it real, have a conversations in your place and countries, and hopefully model making it uh, real in your countries. And my other ask 
uh, while I've got the talking stick, <laughs> is how about considering that an, an ambassador of change exchange program for people with lived experience to go to places like this, share learning and knowledge in leadership space in disability and mental health. Many thanks for listening and I hope you all have a great conference. Thank you. Thank you, and what a great challenge to set out to all of us and, and food for thought. And I wanted to thank all of our panelists. Um, as I was sitting and listening, um, I, was, I was thinking to myself that in June, our ministers from our, our various countries here, from Australia, New Zealand, Canada, and the UK, all sat down at the Conference of States Parties and had a really good discussion. And, and many of the same themes that we're hear, hearing here in, in our at our levels and our, our work and with our communities are coming up, came up with ministers. And, and it's as you, as uh, David, I think, um, well said that uh, we all face same challenges in our countries, even if our policy frameworks are different and our legislative frameworks are different or they're similar in some ways. We, we have on the ground the same, same issues and same challenges. And I think that's really what we're trying to do here at IIDL is, is think about how we can do things differently and how we can learn from one another at, on the ground in our practice and try to bring that back to our countries and innovate and, and take what we can from it. And um, I think you've given us lots of food for thought today. And uh, I really thank you very much for your, your presentations and your contribution. I wanted to say, just in case you didn't know why Canada isn't presenting, um, uh, we have what, what, what is called, and I, I've just discovered this is unique in Canada, that the writ dropped this week in Canada, which means that our election was called. And so we're in the middle of a campaign, and, and as a good public servant, I, I, I am in a caretaker mode, so I will not speak for the government. But I would say that we did have some, some major changes in Canada over the last year, in particular in June. Um, the government passed our Accessible Canada Act, and it came into force in, in July, and that is uh, one of the most significant um, changes, uh, human rights legislations that we've had in our country. Um, so it's it's a it's an it's been an exciting time in Canada as well. And and at the next IADL, I look forward to being able to tell you what what we've been up to and and where things are going. But uh, for now, we'll see what happens on October 21st. So, <laughs> so I I'm now going to pass the floor over to Lorna. And I don't, see, there she is. <laughs> just before we um, bring the session to a close, just wondering whether there are any, anybody might have questions of the panels? Um, anything particularly? I mean, most, peop, most of the people here will be at the marketplace. And that will give you a lot of opportunity then to engage uh, with any questions and to get a bit deeper around what each of the countries are doing. But if there is a burning question that anybody... Thank you, and, and thanks for those presentations. They're all really great and wonderful information. Um, I was wondering if you could speak a little bit about how you all are working to support families. You talked a lot about the way in which you're going about thinking and um, addressing the support needs of individuals with disabilities, and kind of talked a little bit about families and supporting families. Um, it's something that we struggle with here in the US, how to adequately support families. We have, I think, good family peer-to-peer -peer networks. Um, but in terms of government support for families, um, we don't do so well with that. And a lot of individuals, particularly with intellectual and developmental disabilities, continue to live with their families um, throughout their life. Uh, so thinking about how we're supporting them is something that we're interested in. So I was just wondering if you all have been anything to share in that area. I, I can start if that helps. <laughs> Uh, 
Hello. So, at a government, is this is this working? Yes. Good. At a New Zealand level, we spoke about um, our approach to disability. We also have a carer strategy action plan that's um, developed in partnership with across the whole care sector, um, through from Alzheimer's New Zealand to disability, and with families. Um, underneath the New Zealand Care Strategy Action Plan that identifies what is the situation now in New Zealand for families. Um, we've just finished a public consultation a couple of weeks ago on a draft action plan, and that highlights a number of areas where we need to make real improvements. Um, the kind of four priority areas for us that we've been asked to focus on across New Zealand are respite. So we are doing some innovative things, for example, in the disability support space. We've been looking at how we can have more flexible models of respite but it's not gone far enough and we've got um, at the moment we've got respite systems across mental health across aged care um, across disability support services and we've got a commitment yet to be finally agreed by cabinet but it's gone out to consultation on um, joining a more accessible quality respite care We've also been looking at payments for um, family carers. So the thing that's taken up my team's most time over the last year and a half is around funded family care and how we improve the situation under which we will provide payments to the family members that want to provide the supports to the um, disabled people. And um, that also includes mental health and health of older people. As, long, as well as working with um, Ministry of Social Development on how our welfare system really supports disabled people and carers and it's really been highlighted in a recent report that um, these are the people that are struggling the most, they're disadvantaged across a number of areas and we really need to look at um, carers of people with health conditions and disabilities in the families about how we make those improvements. So this is Marianne here from Australia. Um, we do have um, a carer strategy in the Australian government which includes the carers of people with disabilities. In the National Disability Insurance Scheme, um, the families and carers were a big part of the introduction of the legislation, thinking of their needs as, because if we took care of people with disabilities, we have to take care or will inevitably take care of families and carers. Um, carers are a big stakeholder in the work we do with the community as we roll out the NDIS and through our information linkages and capacity building we are um, making focus on grants um, for organisations of and led by people with disabilities as well as families. Families play an important part. We are collecting a huge data set of outcomes as people are in the scheme and some of the domains of which we measure those outcomes are those of carers and those of families. Um, and so there's, there's lots of ways that we are supporting primarily the person with disabilities but are not we don't forget and are mindful of the needs of the family and carers. And I think we've got someone here, Cecilia, you here, she is from our ad family advocacy, yeah. one of our big organisations in Australia that works with families. So she probably would be a good person to talk to as well. Uh, in England, we've got a thing, a program called Partners in Policy Making that looks at uh, uh, families uh, and younger people, and it's run by Lynn Elwell and Julie Stanfield from In Control. And uh, the focus is uh, at the moment they're working with the NHS uh, uh, England, looking at uh, a program about um, transforming care. And uh, the program's called All Together Better, um, looking at how uh, parents, families, and younger people using co-production and informing and shaping what uh, uh, what matters most to them. And this program lasts for, I think it's 13 weeks, uh, but um, family members uh, go on and it's funded by uh, uh, the NHS and sometimes local authorities to help give um, families the knowledge and skills about how to navigate uh, situations that they're facing. Just to, um, this is, is this working? Yeah. yeah. Um, just a couple of other little comments from New Zealand. We do have a 
It's not huge, but it's impactful. Um, a small investment fund for family capacity building. And also on the New Zealand um, marketplace table, there will be the Ministry of Education's partnering with parents of disabled children uh, through the education system. And any other questions? Um, one of the sort of structural features of a, a service delivery support that we're all sort of dealing with is the agency structure. You have agencies very often that receive millions of dollars, have hundreds of employees and that sort of thing. And I've just never heard a discussion about what the role or future role of agencies is as we kind of move to these models. And I guess the other, the, so one, of the un, one of the tensions that exists in, in the sector too is the role of trade unions and of a unionized labor force and what sort of role and how you work and negotiate with those organizations as you try to make some of these transformations. Um, it might be more than the minute we've got. <laughs> But, but perhaps we might <laughs> yeah, but, <laughs> perhaps we might have this as a, a kind of central discussion point in the New Zealand exchange. It will give us a little bit of time to think about it. <laughs> Thank you very For much. So just very quickly, um, there was a, and still is, a workforce working group that's been part of um, Manafakaha and the transformation, and the unions were a key member of that. So there are regular conversations with the unions as we are looking at this change. No, can I, so I, did, I, th I think sort of not quite a, a direct answer to the question, but also maybe more kind of posing a question for other people in the room to discuss afterwards is around... Something I think we're thinking about is that tension between setting a national policy framework and a set of entitlements and balancing that against discretion locally to um, adjust to the needs of the particular population, which inevitably creates differences in the provision and pattern of services from place to place. So I just kind of raise that because I think it's linked to that point about agencies and delivery. And to say, I don't have a perfect answer to it, but if anyone wants to give me that afterwards, that would be wonderful. <laughs> Um, just to add that one of our partners is an organisation called Skills for Care who are doing significant work around workforce strategy and the kind of workforce we need in order to deliver transformed care. So it's worth checking out their website and certainly people from um, our National Co-Production Advisory Group are contributing to that. And the, unions, and the unions are involved in shaping that conversation as well. Well, look, I'd just like to um, thank this panel. Um, clearly provoked a number of questions and issues and um, speaks to some of the complexity as we change uh, from our very traditional um, service models to bottom-up uh, decision-making by disabled people. And some of what we get in the middle is the challenges that we will need to address and work collectively uh, to change, but uh, very much like to thank you all for the contribution that you have made and um, to invite our next uh, presenters where we will look at some of the match reports. I'm struggling with this technology though, so I might need somebody to help me. It doesn't.